Okay, well, good morning, everyone. Good morning to folks here in the Louise Roberts room and to everyone online. So we have had a lot of great adult ed opportunities. So the Bible study we've been doing started on Isaiah last Sunday. So that will be back in session next Sunday. Um, but we've had a lot of great lectures on Middle East peace. And so if you didn't make the afternoon session last week at 1 p.m., um, with Dr. Farage. It was an excellent session, incredibly well researched. That's on YouTube. So I encourage folks to hop onto YouTube and check that presentation out. And so actually it's great timing, Jennifer, for you to be with us as we kind of think about this topic. Mm -hmm. And so we have someone who was a member here at Claremont UCC when you were a student at Azusa Pacific. Is that right? That's right. That's great. So Jennifer Madron, who currently serves as the outreach manager for Churches for Middle East Peace. Perhaps you've heard of that organization. They do incredible work. I know that there's people in the congregation who have been connected to the work that this organization does. And so it's great to rekindle our connection with you. And we're excited to hear about your work, what's going on, what the future looks like. This is one of those issues that seems intractable that there is progress made and then two steps backward and it seems like something that can't be solved but there are great people doing work to try to make as much progress as possible so we are looking forward to hearing uh, from you what's happening right now after getting that history last week of kind of American colonialism and imperialism so um, welcome Jennifer the floor is yours uh, for those who are here in the room, if you, during the question and answer session, want to ask a question, we just encourage you to come up here to the mic and come in front of the camera. That way you can see, um, they can, people online can see you and you can be heard through the microphone. Um, and so Jennifer, if you want to open it up for questions at the end, wrap up around 950, that'll give people time to head into worship. So welcome, Jennifer, the floor is yours. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much for that really warm welcome, Reverend Jacob. Um, can everyone hear me okay who's in the room? Yeah. Okay, okay, great. Um, well, I'm, it's really, uh, it's such a joy to, to get to be with you all today. Um, and I'm glad to hear that this talk uh, or this conversation fits in quite well with uh, conversations uh, you all have been having at the con congregation and especially last week. Uh, so my hope uh, for this time is, is really just to, I'll start by sharing a little bit about myself and my journey because uh, it might be helpful for you all to know where I'm coming from. And then um, and then really just, I, I'd like to provide just a little bit of an introduction into the work that we do at Churches for Middle East Peace and then share some updates in terms of what we're seeing uh, happening right now in the Middle East and in Israel and Palestine in particular. So my, my, um, my spiritual background is in the evangelical church. I was uh, shaped in kind of non-denominational church settings. I ended up going to Azusa Pacific University to study um, for my undergraduate degree. And I would say that my, in my kind of spiritual um, ecclesial formation, I learned a very singular narrative about Israel and Palestine. Um, and, and that is a very particular interpretations of scripture uh, and how those interpretations then impact uh, the, the land today and, and who lives there and, and who might uh, have, have claims to the land. Um, when I was an undergraduate, I went and studied in Jerusalem, studied biblical studies and archaeology there, uh, and kind of became uh, alivened in, in a lot of ways during my time there um, and, and really grew to love the discipline of biblical studies and archaeology, um, which kind of continued for me throughout my academic work. Uh, however, I lived in Jerusalem for five months and it wasn't until the last month that I lived there that I, um, that I actually sought out uh, and spent time in the occupied Palestinian territories in the West Bank for the first time and really got to spend one-on-one -on -one time with Palestinians. And so that time ended up actually shattering a lot of the narratives that had been formed for me and drew up a lot of questions that really spurred kind of my journey from, from then on out. Um, I kind of 
was left with a lot of lingering and nagging questions uh, that ended up uh, kind of being really important questions for uh, for my faith, for my religious orientation, for my field of study, uh, for my kind of relationship to Palestine and Israel as an American Christian, uh, and and all of the um, all of the imperial and colonial legacies that come with that, which sounds like maybe you all explored a bit last week. Uh, and it was during that time where I had a lot of questions that I actually found uh, found a church home at CUCC uh, and and um, found a really beautiful landing place there uh, and, and was then that I started my journey with the United Church of Christ. Um, so it's wonderful to be back with you all today. Um, but as I began to, to lean into those questions and listen to um, maybe God's call for a shattering of some of those narratives I had learned uh, and, and this continued kind of call and question of what, what justice might look like in the context of Palestine and Israel, uh, I ended up spending uh, several more kind of longer stints of time living in, uh, in the occupied Palestinian territories with UCC Global Ministries uh, and, and spent time working at the YMCA and Beit Sahur outside of Bethlehem. Uh, and spent time uh, working with Reverend Dr. Munther Itzak, who is a Palestinian Christian pastor and, and author and theologian. Um, so all of those, all of those experiences shape who I am, shape my work at Churches for Middle East Peace, and then shape my research as well. Um, I'm currently a doctoral candidate in biblical studies, and my research examines how narratives of promised land uh, have actually shaped the physical land uh, of Palestine and Israel and its geopolitics, how those uh, scriptures get constructed uh, to create new realities on the ground uh, and in ways that have been um, to further uh, violence and annexation. Um, so all of these pieces of my journey really shape the work that I am very, very honored to do now at Churches for Middle East Peace, where I get to walk alongside churches uh, in their educational journeys and offer uh, help offer resources and pathways to engage uh, in what I really believe is prophetic um, and effective advocacy work. Um, I think at some point... Um, Actually, I think now I might share a slideshow with you all just to have some words uh, on the screen to, to help track. Hopefully it won't detract too much. Uh, and then I'll, I'll try and leave a good bit of uh, time at the end for conversation so that we can um, be in dialogue. Let me see actually if I have the ability to share my screen. I do. Okay. Uh, so a little bit about Churches for Middle East Peace, or as we affectionately call it, CMEP. Uh, we are a coalition of over 30 member communions, uh, and, and these are Protestant, Orthodox, Catholic, Evangelical, and Peace Church traditions. Um, these are denominational bodies and organizations that come together to make up our board uh, and essentially shape our, our policy positions related to peace building in the Middle East. Um, if any of you have engaged in ecumenical work, then you uh, then you will know that this is um, no short of a miracle that we have all of these traditions coming together uh, and uh, to vote on on policy related to Middle East peace building, nonetheless. Uh, so we are really, really grateful uh, to, to really have such a diverse body that shapes the, the work that we do. Uh, we work at the denominational level, at the level of regional church bodies, uh, with congregations and then with individuals as well. Uh, when it comes to our advocacy and government work, we work at every level of government. We try our best to maintain positive and strong relationships with government officials uh, in the Middle East and here in the US. And ultimately our aim is to shift US policy uh, so that we might then effectively shape just and equitable peace in the Middle East. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about what that looks like. Um, but we kind of do this in three ways. We have three main buckets that we kind of describe our work in, and that's educate, elevate, advocate. Um, in, the, in the realm of education, uh, this happens on, on the individual level and, and on the congregational level, um, but we have a, a number of webinars that we feature um, where we feature, you know, Palestinian, Israeli, American, and other kind of international voices of folks who are really leading the way in, in doing humanitarian work, uh, activism, kind of on the ground peace building, and then um, kind of political negotiation and, and analysis. 
Uh, we also work with churches and other groups uh, to put together multi-narrative trips to the region. And so these are, are most often trips to Palestine and Israel uh, and, and really uh, um, creating experiences where folks can be immersed in the land and hear uh, a, a number of perspectives. It, we use intentionally use language of multi and, and not dual narrative um, because there are not just two narratives. There are uh, a number, a number of, of narratives that you'll hear in the land and, and many of them which conflict with one another. And so, you know, we take um, folks to tour along the separation wall uh, and observe what is happening there in the occupied territories. Uh, you know, we host Shabbat dinners uh, with rabbis in Jerusalem. Uh, we do homestays with Palestinian families and peace builders. Uh, and, and so those are often really important and informative experiences um, for, for church communities to take together. Uh, we do speaking tours throughout the U.S., uh, and then a lot of what I work on is working with um, individual churches and groups to develop uh, educational resources. Um, we have spiritual resources uh, around, you know, Advent and Lenten seasons, um, but also do uh, we have a curriculum on peace building in the Holy Land that small groups often use. We have book studies available. And then um, I, I kind of get to work with individual congregations and figure out uh, kind of what the most effective uh, or most helpful forms of education might be. Uh, so for example, for a few congregations that are engaged in, in racial justice work, we've done film screenings uh, of a film called There is a Field, uh, which kind of explores the intersection between um, Black Lives Matter activists and, and Palestinian activists um, and the loss of life uh, kind of experienced in both communities from systemic state violence. Uh, and so things like that uh, are what get me really excited where we can really, uh, you know, kind of collaborate and, and work together discerning what are the ways in which, you know, our congregations are working locally and invested where they might actually intersect with, uh, with our in investments um, and, and, you know, kind of commitments to, to peace work globally. Uh, this is just a chart that kind of shows uh, how church partners tend to engage in our work, uh, and those are some of the things that I just mentioned, um, but uh, there, there are a number of ways that we kind of have a, a two-way relationship, a Churches from Middle East Peace and our church partners, um, so that we actually support one another's work and, and really get to, to kind of be on the journey together. Uh, when we say elevate, uh, what we mean by that is uh, first and foremost elevating the work uh, of all of those who we partner with in the Middle East. Uh, and so there are a number of, of organizations and individuals who we are in conversation with every week. We have staff on the ground uh, in, in Palestine, in Egypt, uh, at a few places elsewhere internationally. Um, and, and those are with organizations uh, like B'Tselem, Iramim, which are Israeli human rights uh, kind of watch organizations based in Jerusalem, uh, with organizations like Rabbis for Human Rights, uh, Christ at the Checkpoint Conference, uh, which is, is um, a, a conference run by Palestinian theologians. Uh, we partner with folks like Tent of Nations, uh, which is a, a Palestinian family uh, that runs a uh, that their property is a kind of working farm for promoting, promoting nonviolent resistance. Uh, their land has been contested for a number of decades. And so they are um, one, of the, one of the organizations that are under the biggest threat that we are kind of in conversation with weekly about court cases and, and things like that. And uh, they're an organization who has a, a really big uh, Kind of international community around them. Uh, they're the Nasser family, Tent of Nations Farm. And so it's relationships like those where we get to elevate, um, elevate the voices and work of those who are on the ground in the Middle East uh, and then sort of create pathways and lines of connection where we as the church in the U.S. actually can have the opportunity to build relationships with them, uh, to, to support them, things like that. Um, this last year, uh, the Tent of Nations Farm actually um, underwent a, a really intense period where their court cases were um, kept getting pushed back and, and they weren't able to, to make their case in Israeli courts. Uh, and then they experienced uh, some, 
some violence um, from, from local people and the continued kind of uprooting of olive trees. And so one of our church partners um, ended up writing uh, uh, letters to them and, and signed by over hundreds of members of their congregations and sent physical letters to the Nassar family uh, outside of Bethlehem. And so it's, you know, also things like that where we can be uh, witnesses, I think, to, to one another's uh, lives and communities in, in simple but, but powerful ways. Uh, and then another way that we elevate are, are really kind of seeking to, to elevate the voices uh, of all of our constituents uh, in the realm of, of the U.S. political scene. So how might we utilize our, our prophetic voices, our voices as U.S. citizens uh, to actually play an important role uh, in, in peace uh, building in the Middle East? So in terms of our advocacy priorities, um, we focus on human rights, holistic peace building, humanitarian aid. Um, we also uh, kind of, when situations arise, have a big emphasis on uh, the, the sustainment and sustainability of the Christian church in the Middle East. Um, but typically uh, when we are advocating um, congressionally, uh, the focus stays on, on human rights, holistic peace building and humanitarian aid uh, for means of, of efficacy. Uh, we coordinate Hill and government meetings regularly. Uh, we are um, we have opportunities for constituents to engage in action alerts. Uh, we do community advocacy trainings and advocacy summits. Uh, during the pandemic, we've been doing a lot of virtual advocacy trainings and especially kind of training groups on how they might uh, advocate most effectively in this the sort of um, hybrid uh, kind of sphere that we find ourselves in right now politically and the ways to navigate how best to meet uh, with, you know, uh, members of your senator's office and, and things like that. Uh, and we are excited to, uh, to be announcing that this spring we're actually holding our first in-person advocacy summit in Washington, D.C. since the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, and, and historically, these have been very effective gatherings where we bring together uh, church leaders and even heads of communion from across the states uh, to participate in a summit. Uh, this time we'll be featuring three Palestinian Christian speakers uh, who will be sharing, uh, and then we reserve a whole day uh, for coordinating meetings on the Hill um, with, uh, with government officials. So that's something that we have coming up in April. Um, in terms of our advocacy focus for 2022, the majority of our efforts were focused on HR 2590, uh, which is a bill introduced by Betty McCollum uh, and has gone through a few different iterations since she originally introduced it, I believe in in 2021 uh, was when she originally introduced it, um, but it gained uh, a lot of traction this year and especially uh, after the murder of American Palestinian journalist uh, Shireen Abu Akhle uh, earlier uh, in 2022. Uh, so we continued to advocate for HR 2590 throughout uh, and, and essentially the Palestinian Children and Families Act uh, simply ensures that U.S. funding does not go towards uh, the demolition of Palestinian homes, uh, toward the detainment of Palestinian children, uh, and, and kind of other similar uh, violences uh, that are often uh, carried out by the Israeli military, but for which there's currently no, um, no kind of uh, system to, um, to take account of or moderate. So the, the essentially US funds are not currently tracked by the Israeli government in terms of how they're being used and implemented. Uh, the, the second focus of 2022 was on the Yemen war powers resolution. Uh, and, and this uh, resolution uh, would, would simply ensure uh, that the US uh, stop funding the Saudi led coalition in Yemen. Uh, and, and that is um, a resolution that's actually still on the table in 2023 uh, and is something that uh, we have a live action alert out for right now. Uh, there is a there's a Senate um, companion bill to the original uh, House bill that was proposed that had um, over 100 bipartisan signers on it. And so uh, now uh, we're, we're really encouraging constituents to reach out to their, um, to their senators and ask them to sign on to that bill if they have not already. Um, okay, so a little bit about what we're seeing today, and I'll try and keep this uh, brief and and, and 
and focused. Uh, there are a lot of places that where I could go, a lot of updates I could give. So hopefully we can just chat a little bit more about this in the Q&A based on uh, what you all have been seeing and, and what you're curious about. Uh, when it comes to what we're seeing on the ground in Palestine and Israel, um, we are, are continuing to see a, a shifting and evolving status quo. Um, status quo is uh, is kind of the the unofficial uh, but official uh, kind of um, legal ruling in terms of how how holy sites are are shared and how they're maintained, um, primarily in Jerusalem but elsewhere in the land as well. Um, this is the status quo was. Um, it was put into place um, after the 1967 war, uh, and and still uh, kind of regards Jordan as a custodian of the as the Holy Land and as an important party in enforcing the status quo. Uh, what it indicates is that. Uh, people of all religions have access to their holy sites uh, that actually uh, the, the Temple Mount or the Haram al Sharif um, should. Uh, should be open um, access for Muslims and for Christians, um, but that it should not be a place for Jewish prayer, uh, for for issues of, of safety and, and security and what have you. And and so what we've seen really in the last uh, in the last ten to fifteen years is that that status quo is. Um, not being upheld, that those rules are, are not being upheld, that we continue to see um, Israeli government officials who are taking groups to the Temple Mount for prayer, uh, and, and especially during critical times, uh, such as uh, holy days uh, for Muslims. And, and so that's kind of closing down access, restricting access um, to Muslims during holy days. Uh, we also saw last Easter uh, significant restrictions around um, Palestinian entrance into the old city uh, and, and uh, a limit of, of how many could enter uh, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in, in the old city. And, and so news that was not well publicized at all, actually, there were, there were videos online uh, of Israeli military officials um, have had a barricade set up outside of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. They had two lines. Uh, they asked uh, if you are Palestinian uh, or of Arab descent to stand in this line, if you were a foreigner stand in this line, they were allowing foreigners into the Church of the Holy Sepulchre for worship on uh, on, on Holy Saturday uh, and, and Palestinian Christians were restricted from entering and, and there ended up being um, clashes and, and some violence that came out of that. Uh, so that's that's what I mean when I say we're, we're seeing a shifting of the status quo, uh, just kind of the most uh, most basic, uh, you know, kind of uh, laws in place to, to ensure, uh, you know, kind of religious freedom and, and access to religious sites is, is not being upheld. Uh, and, and so that's uh, something that we're watching closely and uh, are having conversations with, with government officials about and, uh, and have had a few, a few public statements about it just in the last few months. Uh, something else that we're seeing, uh, which you all have, I, I imagine, have, have seen a, a good bit of news on, are, are just the, the really rapid expansion and, and, and increased, uh, you know, kind of eviction threats, but rapid uh, expansion of settlements uh, in, in the occupied territories and also in East Jerusalem. Uh, and, and so we're seeing Palestinian neighborhoods and areas uh, such as Sheikh Jarrah and Masaf Riyata, uh, where hundreds of, of Palestinian homes um, are, are being threatened with eviction. In Masaf Riyata, it's uh, 1,100 people uh, that, are, that are at threat of, of being evicted and displaced and, and half of those being children. Uh, and so these are, are areas that we have um, in increased concern over, given the new uh, the new uh, Israeli government and the new coalition that was just formed. Um, you know, we're not necessarily seeing uh, you know a huge shift in in terms of their their uh, approach or or their kind of stances related to settlement expansion. But yet we're seeing it named much more explicitly by those who are in the highest seats of government that they will uh, 
make these changes that they will, you know, develop settlements and displace Palestinians um, rather than it being a, a more uh, covert uh, kind of in, intentions. So that's that's what we're seeing right now with the beginning of this new government. Uh, and then something else that we continue to see is uh, the use of, of court cases and, and delaying them as a tactic for annexation. And so one example of this is with the Tent of Nations farm that I talked about just a little bit earlier. Um, they are a family, a Palestinian family uh, with land in the occupied Palestinian territories. Their land has been contested uh, both by Israelis and Palestinians actually, uh, but for years, uh, their their court cases where they you know have the opportunity to take uh, all of their documentation of their ownership of the property, uh, you know any other documentation of attacks against them, uh, anything like that, where those opportunities are are delayed again and again. Uh, we see that with you know individual families, but also with situations like um, there were proposals out. Actually, I think they went out originally in 2021 for the expansion of uh, Jerusalem Walls National Park, which is a national park uh, that kind of uh, goes around the old city of Jerusalem and, and hugs around, uh, if you've been to the land or, or have seen the geography, goes through the Hinnom Valley a little bit, uh, is, is a green space that is growing uh, through East Jerusalem territory, which has involved uh, the eviction and displacement of, of Palestinians. Um, but we, we saw the same, the same kind of tactic used uh, where this proposal was put out uh, to expand this national park it, through a Palestinian neighborhood where eviction would need to take place in order for that to happen. Um, there was actually an uproar in um, in, in kind of uh, public dissent against that decision. Nonprofits were speaking out, um, actually uh, global leaders were speaking out. And so that, that court case was delayed and um, actually has not been brought back publicly to the Jerusalem municipality since then. Uh, and, and oftentimes when that happens, uh, the, the work for that expansion kind of continues to go on under this, behind the scenes uh, without being reintroduced to the court, at least for this time. So that's another uh, another very uh, damaging tactic that, that we've been seeing. Um, in terms of what's going on elsewhere in the Middle East, um, I'll, I'll just say first, you might have noticed that I'm really focusing on, um, on Palestine and Israel in my talk today. And when it comes to the work of Churches for Middle East Peace, about 70% of our work is focused on Israel and Palestine and about 30% is focused on elsewhere in the Middle East. Uh, we also work in Jordan, in Egypt, uh, in, in Lebanon, in, in Yemen, in a little bit in Syria, uh, and, and are, are starting to um, expand our focus to Armenia, although it's not technically in the Middle East. Um, but those are all areas where we recognize uh, our work is needed and <laughs> needs to grow. Uh, and yet at the same time, uh, we are a small staff, a small organization. And, and so we engage in those areas as we can while trying to, to kind of keep our focus and, and really hone the ways that we're able to support churches and, and elevate uh, US Christian voices when it comes to the issue of Israel-Palestine. Um, but in, in Jordan, uh, this last year, we saw a reaffirmed commitment from the Jordanian government regarding their stewardship of the Holy Land. Um, so in the beginning of 2022, Churches for Middle East Peace was able to convene uh, a meeting in the States for King Abdullah of Jordan. Uh, and, and we convened that meeting with, with a number of of um, heads of denominations in the US and, and actually globally. Uh, so we had uh, over 20 church leaders there at this meeting with King Abdullah and, and were able to, um, to really share with him um, and, and reinforce the, the important role that Jordan plays really um, in, in protecting uh, holy sites and ensuring religious freedom in, in Israel and Palestine and in Jerusalem in particularly. And after that, we actually saw uh, his administration making a public statement about their reaffirmed commitment to that. And so um, for us, that was kind of a, a really, really positive step in the right direction. Um, in Yemen, we are seeing just the, the continuation of an extreme, extreme humanitarian crisis. And, 
and a lot of this at the hands of, of the Saudi-led coalition. And so this is why we are continuing to advocate um, for the Yemen war powers resolution. And uh, we have not seen the, the turn that's needed yet in terms of, of co-signers for the Senate companion bill, uh, but it's something that, that we are, are continuing uh, to advocate for and are working on uh, with our, our local advocates um, that we have. Um, in Armenia, um, although it's not technically in the Middle East, uh, it's an area that, that we have, as an organization, have turned our attention to as of late. Uh, our executive director took a small delegation of, of Christian leaders to Armenia last fall, uh, and they were able to, to meet with a number of, of Armenian church leaders. Uh, and, and even just since then, at the end of the year, uh, we've really since seen a halt in the Karabakh peace process uh, and a blockade of the, the corridor that goes between Armenia and Azerbaijan and, uh, and just seeing um, a, a really, really significant restriction in freedom of movement and uh, the movement of resources as well. And so uh, they're just seeing a restriction of access to uh, things like food, basic medical attention, and things like that for those on the Armenian side of the border. Um, I think that's where I want to stop now, and I, I really do just want to allow uh, a good bit of time for conversation, for question and answer. Um, so I will, I will uh, stop now. I'll, I'll open up the floor, and, and I'm happy to, to chat about any of the things I've spoken about or other things uh, that I may not have, have shared about, uh, and even if it's an, a tangent or about my own research or anything like that, happy to chat about it. Great, thank you so much, Jennifer, and thank you for the incredible work of this organization. So I'm gonna be heading to the sanctuary in just a minute to get ready for worship, but open it up for questions. If you are online, feel free to ask a question in the chat, Jennifer. If you have the chat open, you can monitor that or unmute and um, ask a question that way. If you're in the room and you have something you wanna ask, come up forward, look uh, at Jennifer here on the screen and use the mic that way everyone can see and hear you. Um, but any questions here in the room to start off with? Bill, are you coming up? Yeah. All right, Bill's coming up to kick us off. Great. Thank you uh, very much for your presentation and thanks for all the work that you're doing. It seems to be very admirable. I'm sitting here sort of thinking about the, uh, the arc of history maybe. What, where mm -hmm. are we coming from? Where are we going? Is If I look at things on a day-by-day -day basis, it's very troubling. It mm -hmm. seems to be that we seem to be constantly in conflict with one another. And if I look for measures of attitudes, um, it's hard to find anything that I can look at beyond elections, but don't do it very favorable either. So how, how do you view where we are now, uh, where we've come from, where we are going in the future? Yeah, thank you, Bill. I really appreciate that question. And, and it's an important one, especially, in, in response to, uh, you know, kind of the sentiments you just described, when we look at the news or, or when we, you know, get the results from recent elections, uh, the, the news is often not good. <laughs> and so the results uh, can often be just immense discouragement um, uh, and, and feeling, you know, sort of helpless or, or hopeless in the situation. And um, I will just say those are all feelings that our team uh, and all of those involved in this work are, are well familiar with and, and are in solidarity on. However, I think I'll say a couple of things about kind of where we've been and, and what we're seeing. Um, the realities on the ground today that we're seeing are, are worsening. Um, by the day, they're they're much worse than the last five years, ten years. Uh, this this last year in 2022, we saw uh, the just the the kind of sharp increases um, of violence that we saw um, in Israel and Palestine were um, were likened to the se the second intifada by by a number of political analysts and and kind of specialists. Um, you know, we're we're seeing. A uh, new kind of legislation that was passed um, related to 
uh, freedom of movement uh, in, in the Palestinian territories for internationals, uh, for those who are, are spouses or um, family members of Palestinian citizens. So we're seeing uh, increased restrictions of movement. Um, we're, we're seeing, um, you know, like I said, a deterioration of the status quo. Uh, rapid increase of settlements. Um, however, when we think about the big picture, um, and especially, you know, when we when we think about the the kind of sphere in U.S. politics or within the U.S. church, uh, we're we're actually seeing improvement, uh, and and that I find to be really encouraging. So the the ways in which um, not only are, you know, we'll just say like the, the mainline church, you know, kind of broadly speaking in the United States, not only the, the openness to bring conversations about Israel-Palestine or the broader Middle East, the, you know, there's an, there's an increase there in a willingness, but also an increase in a commitment to make it a central part of church's, uh, you know, mission, education, justice work. Uh, we're also seeing a, a lot of a lot of movements uh, among evangelical spaces as well, uh, which is extremely encouraging. Um, a, a lot of um, a lot of large mega churches have actually recently um, become very open to CMEP's work. Have hosted us uh, to speak in person. Uh, have invited us to lead uh, prayer services. Have invited us to lead small group discussion. Uh, and and these are things that we haven't seen before. So I mean, if we think about the big picture and we think about where the American church was at in the 70s, the 80s, uh, the days of Hal Lindsey, uh, we're, we're seeing, um, you know, I would say a, a more critical um, kind of relationship between the church and um, in the U.S. government's policies when it comes to the Middle East and especially Israel-Palestine uh, and, and especially within the evangelical church. We're seeing a lot of criticism from younger evangelicals, from millennials uh, who, who are not ready to, to buy into this kind of singular narrative, uh, who have a lot of critical questions and who are very keen on uh, connecting with the Palestinian Christian community. Um, in terms of in terms of what we're seeing from Congress right now and what we're seeing from the Biden administration, um, I will say uh, we did not have high hopes, I think, for, for the Biden administration to really engage uh, critically uh, in the Middle East. Uh, the administration, you know, inherited a, a lot of really prescient domestic issues uh, that they turned their attention to right away and, and made that known that that would be, uh, you know, their priorities. Um, but I would say, you know, from our advocacy team on our staff and, and you know, other folks um, in the political sphere that we've been in conversation with, there has been, I would say, just kind of widespread disappointment of the administration's really poor response to, uh, you know, increased violence in Israel, Palestine, in the Middle East, uh, and 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 in some ways, you know, a, a pretty, a pretty blatant um, kind of turning of an eye to, to some issues, um, and and some of that too, I, I think, has to do with. Uh, with the the crisis and and war in the Ukraine and um, and some of the um, you know really important kind of international attention that has need to be turned there, but at the same time, uh, as many analysts and activists have pointed out, uh, you know it, it becomes very clear that the U.S. government um, is is able to impose sanctions and, and divest from particular nations that are occupying other nations, um, but that that um, doing so uh, for the government of Israel, for example, at this time is, is not something that, that we'll be seeing from our administration anytime soon. And that continues to be something, uh, something that we'll push on. Um, I see a question in the chat here. Yeah, okay, so the, the question from Keith is, is where have you seen positive response from our government in putting pressure on Israel to stop the demolition of Palestinian housing and killing of people? We still give money and ask little accountability for its use. Um, yeah, that's a great question, Keith. I see someone up front now, so maybe you'd like to ask your question as well and then I can answer them both. Okay, um, thank you. Okay, my question is, uh, you mentioned about the family 
that had the property um, that was being, um, I'm not sure exactly what was, it was being argued, uh, of course the Israelis, but also the Palestinians were um, not in favor of something. I, I forget how you put it. Mm -hmm. Could you say, uh, or could you tell us uh, what that is that, that the um, both sides were in disagreement about with the family mm -hmm. of, the, of the orchard? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, I'll, I'll answer Keith's question first. Uh, so I, I think the, the most positive movement that we've seen from the US government regarding putting pressure on Israel to stop the demolition of Palestinian homes and killing of Palestinians are, are around uh, HR 2590, the Palestinian Children and Families Act, uh, and uh, the Justice for Shireen Act. Uh, so HR 2590, uh, the, there, there was a, a, a Senate companion bill that was introduced uh, in 2022. It um, it has not gained the, the amount of traction that it needs, and yet it's important to have um, to have had a number of senators sign on to that bill uh, and, and just to continue to introduce it to our representatives, uh, even if, for example, I live um, in the Cincinnati area, so I live in southern Ohio, um, I had meetings with, uh, with both of my senators, and uh, both of them were I would say pretty obviously uninterested in, in supporting um, the Palestinian Children and Families Act, um, but yet one of them, uh, you know, had a relationship to someone on the Foreign Affairs Committee and was actually really interested in the committee's response to HR 2590 and said that he would reach out to some contacts and start a conversation and he, he was just curious in in their perception of it. And so the more that we can put this legislation before our representatives and and you know, really stir any kind of con conversation. Um, the more that those are, are things that are on their mind that they might be thinking about when two, four years from now uh, they you know get an assignment to a committee and and have to you know make a call on something. So, although the movement with HR twenty five ninety has been slow, I, you know it is important that a companion bill has been introduced, that it's been legislation on the table for a couple of years now, uh, and it's it's something that you know a small, smaller number and of mostly Democratic representatives continue to push for. Uh, the Justice for Shireen Act um, was introduced at the end of 2022 um, and really just asked that the U.S. Uh, conduct a, a thorough and transparent investigation of the murder of Shireen Abu Akleh uh, and, and is something that, you know, the U.S. government has, or the Biden administration has expressed you know, just some varied answers on that they, you know, plan to conduct an investigation, but not the kind uh, that really needs to happen so that it's a, a public and, and thorough investigation. Uh, so that's something uh, that, you know, it would, if there's kind of, if we see a move for there to be some traction around it, um, again, it, it could be something that, that is kind of back on the table, but uh, things have quieted down on that front a little bit in terms of just the transitions happening right now in Congress. Um, in terms of the question about uh, Tent of Nations Farm and the, um, the kind of contestations of the Nassar family's land, um, the, those are, they have come from both the Israeli government and from Palestinian citizens. Um, and the the reason for that is uh, there there is a little there's not a lot of land uh, in in the West Bank and it continues to shrink due to annexation uh, and and so the the contestation really comes from around whether the amount of of acres um, or denims that the the Nassar family owns are actually the correct amount of acres. And so the, um, my understanding is that the Palestinians who, you know, did bring a case against them, it wasn't that the land didn't belong to them at all, but that they had, you know, taken more acres than were allotted to them. Uh, and, and I, I could be wrong on this, but my understanding as well is the, um, the case from the Israeli government is that, uh, none of the land belongs to them. And so there is, a a common sort of, there are so, so, so many cases around 
land ownership uh, for Palestinians. And a lot of this comes from um, the, the transference of land ownership through various periods of occupation uh, and uh, whether or not those forms um, of, of proof of land ownership are, are you know, kind of fully validated and accepted by the Israeli government. So for the Nassar family, for example, they have proof of ownership, um, I believe existing back to the Ottoman occupation. So they have proof from the Ottomans, uh, from the British government, um, and then from the Israeli government or, or from the, not Israeli government, from the Jordanian authority. And so um, there are a lot of different places wherein, you know, ownership can be contested. And, and again, I, that it's another tactic that we see where there's um, contestation from, you know, multiple sides or, or from various periods of occupation. Uh, and that's where things can get pretty messy. Um, I, I know we have just a couple of minutes left. Uh, any additional questions from folks in the room? Oh, I see someone there. Yeah. Um, I have a question. Today's New York Times mentions, mentions, yeah, the uh, um, the erosion of democracy now with this new administration and how the coalitions are going to take it ever more to the right. Um, it talked about things like having Parliament have the power to override the Supreme Court, um, mm -hmm. giving them almost carte blanche to expand settlements wherever they want. Um, totally anti-Arab ministers being appointed for cabinet positions. So what does that do to an organization like yours? Do you, do you feel threatened? Will you be able, could they throw you out? Um, will you be able to work with such, a, such an administration? So I'm just curious about what's happening that way. Yeah, thank you. It's a, it's a really good question. Um, I, I can't speak to you know the specifics of, of that article uh, or what the the new coalition or government you know will or, or will not be able to do but just kind of the list that you just described are among things that I would say we've been hearing you know could be could be possible uh, you know we're seeing for the first time in, in quite some time just like you said the the explicit um, anti-Arab hate used by, you know, those who are elected in, into, um, you know, some of the highest positions in government, uh, you know, uh, ministers encouraging uh, Israeli citizens to arm themselves with guns in public uh, and, and to carry out uh, displacement in certain neighborhoods that way. Uh, you know, this is really, really, really uh, intense, violent, aggressive language that we're seeing from the halls of government. So, uh, you know, I think as an organization, um, it, it doesn't so much change our relationship with the Israeli authorities. I, I, I would say that we don't have, uh, you know, historically, we have not had relationships with those kind of in those highest positions of government. And um, if so, I don't think they would be the fondest of our work. And so, um, you know, we'll continue to work with those on lower levels that we do there. And, um, you know, with partnering with a lot of Israeli and, and Palestinian, you know, NGOs that are kind of doing doing this work. Um, I, I can't say, but I think, um, I think a lot of a lot of international NGOs are, are feeling pressures and threats right now, and especially those that have permits to be in the West Bank, uh, because I think some of those current, you know, certainly could be under threat, um, especially with the new kind of permit system that was put into place that even uh, it affects those who are going uh, to travel for education for long term volunteer positions. And, and so I think it we would be remiss not to um, not to keep an eye on all of those things and not to think that, um, you know, these um, these sort of permissions that we've been granted could could not, you know, be under threat very soon. And so that those are just the those shifting realities are ones that we always have to be aware of. Um, and and I would just say we're, we're very, very concerned about the new government that's in place and and I think if we have seen any trends um, globally in terms of, you know, far right movements that have gained uh, public traction in the U.S., in Brazil, uh, you know, I, I think we, our eyes need to be, um, need to be on, on Israel and Palestine. And, and I think there's a really, really important role that we can play um, 
as American citizens and, and utilizing the, the voices that we have and, and really the, the kind of privilege that we have, um, you know, in a, being able to advocate here on our own soil and, and globally. Um, but I, I think, you know, even, even before this new government went into place, we were, we were seeing, um, you know, protests last summer and, and last spring that were breaking out in Jerusalem, um, where, you know, large, large numbers of people were chanting death to Arabs, uh, and, and just really, really explicit anti-Arab hate, uh, and anti-Palestinian sentiment. And so, uh, when that same rhetoric is, is mirrored in, in those in the highest positions of power, uh, I think, uh, We've we've seen uh, in the U.S. context the effect of that, and so I think it's it's something that that we should be actively speaking out against, and I think a place where um, you know where the global church can actually play a, a really important role and and have a, a prophetic voice in that way. Um, well, I know that it is now. Uh, I've gone a little bit over, but I want to thank you all for sharing time with me this morning, uh, for offering me the opportunity to speak and share with you all. Uh, I'm happy to be in further conversation. If any of you would like to reach out, uh, my email is jennifer at cmep.org. So I'd be happy to, to chat more. Uh, but again, uh, just really good to be with you all. And I'm grateful uh, for the work that I know that you all are doing as a congregation. Uh, I know where your priorities are in terms of justice work, in terms of advocacy. So grateful uh, for the congregation that you are and to have had the opportunity to spend some time with you all this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Peace to you.